PFSense supports high availability. PFSense is capable of having multiple nodes act as a cluster for high availability. This article is a brief overview of the hardware redundancy chapter of the PFSense book. So I'll leave links to all this. This is just the publicly available documents from NetGate, and I highly recommend reading through all of it if you really want to get a deep understanding of this. They also, and I'll leave a link to it, have a Hangouts they did, I think it was about a year ago, and they offer a also in-depth guide where they walk you through high availability and talk about scenarios related to it. Now, PFSense does high availability with the common address redundancy protocol, along with a few other things. So it's actually kind of a collection of services uh, that they have. So they have the CARP protocol, the common address redundancy protocol, to facilitate seamless switchover when, when the master fails and goes right over to the backup. It also uses XML RPC sync and it uses PF sync. The PF sync is so not only are they sharing an IP address so the IP addresses stay up when one of the servers goes down, it's also syncing all the state tables between the firewalls and that's very important if you want seamless failover because if you fail over a firewall and then switch over to another one even if it has the same IPs, there's a pause because there is systems with those states and are expecting those states to be there to continue the connection from one side of the firewall to the other. And if you don't have the state tables synced, it's very much not seamless. All the routes have to rebuild. And that's what they have is that PF sync. So the backup firewall really isn't doing much. This is not like load balancing. Uh, that's completely different. This is just a hot spare, ready to go, and all the configuration is synchronized, the shared IPs are synchronized, and the state tables are synchronized. Read through all of this, and I have a lot of details on troubleshooting it and all the little you know, nitty gritty if you have specialized setups and things like that. We're gonna do a pretty basic setup on this. We're doing it in my lab. Because we're doing it in my lab, we're gonna have to make a few assumptions. I do not have a bunch of public IP addresses available. So this is our lab setup, and we're just gonna pretend, uh, we'll use our imagination here, that 172.16.69.25 and the 172.69 network, that's gonna act as our WAN. I know it's a private IP range. Someone likes to point that out in the comments. Yes, I'm aware, this is for testing. So here is the first PFSense configured with this 172.16, I fixed that, it's actually 69.112 and type this one wrong as well. This one is gonna be 69.242. And then this is the common uh, IP between them for uh, the other side of the network. So we'll get these details in a second, but this is gonna give you an overview of it. Now, a couple of the requirements for high availability. That's, it, that's a really important part of this. For a cluster to function, a few things are required. Minimum of three IP addresses per subnet. And I brought that up and that's why I went and talked about that. There's a couple different IPs on this and this is where it can be a, a problem for some people because even the WAN has a minimum requirement of a slash 29 network because you have to have a public available IP address for each one of the cluster. So the master and the backup have to both have an IP address and it has to be public, it has to be on the WAN side. Then they have a shared IP address. That's the third IP address they need public. So if you are running a single instance, like a single uh, WAN IP and you're going, but I wanna do this, you're going to have to get two more IPs all in the same subnet in order for this to work. Now the same rule applies to the private IP side, the LAN side and every uh, network you create subsequently in between, they all required as three IPs, one for each of the PFSense uh, in the cluster, and then the third one is the one that all of your devices will use to do all the routing. So that is an important aspect that you have to do that and repeat it as you create different networks uh, that you want to be part of the high availability. And if you have them not as part of the high availability and one of them in the firewall goes down, those networks will fail that you didn't set up this way. Layer two equipment has to have properly handled multicast, a dedicated interface for state and configuration synchronization. So we have those configured as well. Um, and make sure your upstream ISP other involves routers that properly respect the addresses used by CARP. So when CARP creates an address, it's a unique address shared between two computers at the same time, which you're going, hey, that doesn't work well. They've got a special way that it does work. I'm not gonna dig into the details. You can read about it, but the CARP virtual IP address is 
shared between two devices because that's what you want to give your devices to use and the two machines figure out who actually handles that IP address based on the master handles it unless the master fails and then it switches over to the secondary system, the backup system to use that IP address. So it is important that your ISP doesn't interfere with that and it kind of goes back into the layer two equipment multicast. Now you may have problems running this in a virtualized environment. Uh, if you're running it virtualized, sometimes you have to enable promiscuous mode and there's some more trouble shooting related to problems you have running this in a uh, virtual environment. Ideally, this is going to be on hardware. And speaking of hardware, they do sell HA configured systems from PFSense. Now, when you're building an HA system, the other requirement, not listed there, but is that the best way to do this. I know there are other ways, and some will point out, but you can do this. Yeah, there's kind of workarounds, but you ideally want the machines to be identical. If they're not identical, there are sometimes problems because it wants to sync the state table to, let's say WAN is IGB zero, it will want to sync IGB zero states the other way. They talk about in their Hangouts ways to work around that, but obviously the more ideal situation if you have two firewalls that are identical, bought at the same time, and put together as in this HA cluster, you're just going to have less problems and less troubleshooting and less workarounds that you have to do. So, and generally if you're planning an HA system, you're not going, I'll, I'll buy it later. Just get them all at once and configure it from the get-go. So let's go back over to our configuration. Here is the virtual IP we're going to use for WAN. Here's the LAN, and like I said, here's the master. 112 is going to be the master. 242 is going to be the backup. These are both slash 24. That's They're all in there. Even though they're not close in range, that's because it's slash 24. Obviously, you usually have, if you're doing a slash 29, a, a nice little narrow range, uh, but you get the idea. Matter of fact, all these networks are going to be slash 24. Now, physically, the way they're plugged in, we have a switch that will, it's all virtual because it's my lab, but you'll plug the two WAN sides into a switch and the two LAN sides into a switch that handles multicast. And there's some troubleshooting if you have a managed switch, uh, which is not required, but if you do have one, uh, you may have to make some other adjustments like turn off, I think IGMP snooping has to be off for this uh, to work, but they have, a, once again, read through the documentation, but this does not require a managed switch. It just requires a switch to work. Now, the sync doesn't require a switch at all. This would be a network cable just between the two boxes, and you dedicate a port to it, whatever port you do, and just make it the same on both of them and say, this is the sync. And what the sync is, is a system by which all the data transfers back and forth. The configurations are pushed this way. The uh, PFs sync, as in all the state tables get pushed this way. And it has nothing to do with the CARP side at all. That's not uh, tied to this interface. But if you have it as a dedicated one, you don't have to worry about anything slowing it down. Technically, you could tell them to sync between uh, the LAN side, but now you have all that traffic and all that sync traffic also clogging up your LAN. So having a, just take two ports on it, one for each firewall and dedicate them to sync, away you go. Now, because I said, there's not really data traversing this as much as there is like, it's not like the feed goes through the sync to get it over to here. It just synchronizes all the state tables, but that can still end up being a lot of traffic and you don't want it interfering or causing problems with. So you want these two things to be clean. And I just bring this up because it's kind of an important aspect to make sure that they're syncing in time because if they're not, the failovers wouldn't be seamless. And if you use something like the 7100 that I showed uh, from NetGate, that has extra ports, just take a couple of them and dedicate to it. And like I said, no, no switch needed. It's just a direct cable into the firewall. Now for clarity, this is the 112 server. This is the 242 server. The uh, theme I set on this one to the light colored theme, this is the backup. Uh, we will be using this one less other than, you know, setting it up a couple settings we have to put in here. Uh, most will be done in here. This is easy way to distinguish between them. So whenever you see me in the dark uh, theme versus the light theme, this is going to be the backup server. All changes should start here at this server, uh, and then that way they're pushed over to the other one. That's an important aspect of it. Um, even when the other one becomes the master, because if this one fails, you still want to make sure all your changes start always in the master, and if the master fails, get it back up and running and fixed, and then still push changes that way. Because any changes done in the backup server are overwritten if they're part of what's synced from the master. It'll just keep overwriting them, for example, firewall rules.
All right, so let's get started on this. As I said, the prerequisites are two cleanly loaded. Uh, don't put a bunch of stuff on it. Just clean load a couple PF Sense boxes or buy them. Uh, buy a pair from NetGate. Come up with an IP range that works for you so you know where your IPs are going to go. Uh, we have the LAN 40.2, and then the other one is 40.3 because we want our LAN to be 40.1. That's going to be our CARP address, so we have to not use the same address on there because each of these boxes still has to maintain their own IPs. So this is the three IPs for the LAN, and then here's the WAN 242 and 112 on this one. And the sync addresses just can't be the same, uh, but as long as we're in the same network, I just made a simple slash 24 uh, network with a 10 and called this one 10.1.10.2, uh, and this one's 10.3. I just did it for naming consistency because these have a two in it. It's really your own preference, however you want to do it. And I named the interface sync, so I'm never mistaken about what's going on over there. And on both systems, we have admin. Both systems, I have the same password. This is for convenience uh, for when we set this up. And the firewall rules are really simple uh, in both systems. I have this because I want to operate from in front of them. So I have the WAN opened up on the firewall and allow remote access. And then under LAN, just a generic open rule. Sync, a generic open rule as well. It, there's really not much going to be happening here because the only thing this is going to be do is plugged in and dedicated to that sync port. So nothing real special about any of that. Like I said, they're identical on both. Because we want to create all the rules once we have this set as master. That way they just push over to the other side. Let's get to the first step. On the system that we want to be master, we're going to go to System, High Availability Sync, turn it on. Choose the Synchronize interface. Then put the IP for the secondary sync interface. So we'll put this here, Synchronize Config to this one. And we'll just hit toggle all. You can have special use cases where you may not want certain things configured, but for the most part, I can assume you're going to use all because you want this to be master and to keep them identical, but it does have granular options if you don't for some reason. Admin is the other system's name. Put in the password. Save. And uh, we can go over here to diagnostics, whoops, or status, system logs. No errors. If you were to put the wrong password, you'll get a system notice that it worked, but that seemed to work perfectly fine. I didn't get any errors, so now we have high availability uh, enabled on here. But when you go to like status carp, because we haven't created any addresses, nothing's defined, so there's not much to look at yet. But the next thing is, in case someone's wondering, and I'll do this, the user managers are in sync. So here is the admin and a Tom user. Admin and a Tom user. Let's make a sync user. Maybe we want to change the admin. Now, these are synchronized between here, but you maybe want to disable admin and then create users, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to go hit save. And please note, no, I did not give that person any permissions. I'm going to go back in there. Add system HA node sync. Save. So the only permission this sync user has is that. So we'll do this. Hit save. Go ahead and... Uh, refresh this page, and there's our sync user. Shows right up over here. So now we can go to system, high availability sync, leave everything else the same. Sync. There we go. And now this system synchronized using that user. Now the advantage of that is, and why I did this one, Minimum permissions, don't need to add any more than we need to to a particular user. And my general rule is I disable admin and create a different user, less guessing. That way people don't know what user, you know, not that I think security to obscurity is great, but at least they can try admin all they want. When we're done, we'll disable that. Uh, so they have to know what username is assigned there. Just a little housekeeping uh, for doing that. Okay. Next thing we're going to go ahead and do is let's create some CARP addresses. So we go to Firewall, Virtual IPs, Add, CARP. Now, where are we going to attach them to? These are, well, let's do our uh, WAN side first. And we'll do this IP. It's a slash 24. It's attached to the WAN. Now, the good news is the virtual password set a good password, but uh, you don't have to remember it once you typed it here. Uh, let's see, WAN IP. Uh, once you've done this, 
hit save, apply. We go over here, firewall virtual, oh, firewall virtual IPs. Away we go. It already came over here, so you don't have to remember the password and put it back in this. As we add the virtual IPs over here, they're going to show up over there. So let's go ahead and add now our LAN side. Choose CARP address. Oh, LAN IP. Make sure this is a slash 24. And we tie this one to LAN. Save, apply. Now, in the, uh, you're a lucky person who has a lot of IPs and you want to uh, attach more of them, you can. I mean, if you have more WAN IPs, and we'll just add one real quick here. We'll add 24. second WAN, so on and so forth. So if you have a big block of them, this is where you would assign all of them on there uh, that you're going to be using. So when you apply the changes and we go over here and we'll just, they're showing up over here in the same way. Like I said, you don't really have to do much with the backup once they're in sync with each other. Uh, everything just kind of flows over once you have them synced. Now let's go over here and we got to fix the NAT. And what we're doing here is Fixing, we're going to go to hybrid, save, and add, and this is an important aspect to add right here. You want to say that a particular address is going to use the CARP. If not, when it's going through the master, it'll use the master uh, WAN address. When it's going through the backup, it'll use the backup IP address. But this would not create a seamless failover uh, because if the system failed over, it would be stuck on over there and all the states wouldn't really be in sync. So what we're going to do here is we're going to choose our WAN IP, the CARP WAN IP, and we're going to choose the network source. Zero slash 24. Now there's a couple different choices here. Um, for this particular demonstration, because we're using some of the RFC 1918 private IP ranges for our WAN, we're not going to choose that. But you can choose like an alias for an RFC uh, network and say all those, or you could just create individual groupings, or maybe you have a series of translations where you have to have different things going out different IPs. There's a lot of different options there. I'm skipping IPv6 just I don't have this set up on these particular firewalls. So it's WAN, IPv4, network, and we're doing uh, the 40 slash 24. We'll only have one network uh, for demonstration. But we want to make sure the address translation goes out that. Set outbound to CARP. And we'll go ahead and apply the changes. Now. I didn't duplicate, but you can if you want this rule here. If someone's using a VPN that requires ISAKMP, that does need what they call static port translation, which means don't assign a random port, uh, come in and out of, in this case, port 500. So if you have a firewall need for that, you'll have to duplicate that rule. I'm just skipping it for now. But when you do this here for this outbound NAT change, we're gonna go over here, firewall, NAT, outbound, once again, it's part of the rules, so it flows right over to the secondary system as well. Next thing we gotta do, go to DHCP servers. And this is an important aspect as well. We have to fix the DHCP server. By default, DHCP servers is gonna wanna hand out the address of the uh, whatever server is handing it out, the master in this case. So we have to put the gateway in as the CARP address. This means hand out to the machines this particular CARP address. The other thing we need to put in there is what's the failover peer? Dot three, because but here, this is 40.3. And we can't have two DHCP servers trying to hand things out. So failover is failover IP of 40.3. So we go here, save, hand out the carp. There's the failover. And now here's the cool thing. If you go over here, DHCP server, it's smart enough to know that the failover IP for this is 40.2. We didn't have to put or change anything, but by pushing the setting here of .3, it says, hey, 
your dot two, so you're the failover, and basically they go ahead and configure that. So that way the DHCP works on both. And that's something that is synchronized as well is the DHCP leases. So there's no lease changing, uh, they're in sync on that. So when new addresses come in, it doesn't say, hey, this is reserved or not reserved, or this is available in the pool, uh, because that's kept all in sync. So it won't accidentally hand out IP addresses if the master fails that are already in use. They keep all that uh, information in there. And of course, uh, having the failover with the DHCP server means the DHCP server can't, can't run on both. So this would, keeps them from trying to fight with each other at all. It, the, the master hands it out, the backup does if the master's not available to hand out IP addresses. So now we're going to go over here to status and cart failover, and we see that this system is set up as the master, status, cart failover, and this is set up as the backup. And we're going to go over here, and this computer is uh, 192.168.40.107. So if we look over here, just in the uh, DHCP tables, we can see that computer's right here. It has an IP, so away we go. It's good to go. It's sitting there, booted up, and uh, working through our virtual firewall environment. So let's create a rule. And then we're gonna go here to NAT. This is add a rule, so I wanna SSH into that. 107, port 22. Now here's the part that's important. Normally, you're used to, if you've created a lot of rules, you're like, oh yeah, you just, no problem, and uh, SSH to Debian, and create the rule. But you don't want to create it on the WAN address. If not, you'd only create the rule for just the master firewall, and that's not the ideal thing. So you have to make sure whenever you're doing this, you choose which one you want. And the virtual IP show up right here. So we're going to choose dot .25, so the virtual WAN IP we assigned to this, and hit Save, Apply, and now we can SSH into that machine. And we'll go here and just to show you again, NAT, same thing, rules fly right over. Now in case you're wondering, and I'll do this as a quick demonstration. Uh, test on backup. You can create rules on the backup server and they don't show up here, but what's Interesting, if we just edit this rule at all, and you don't have to create a other rule, we'll just put X on here, and apply, we refresh. The rules get overwritten. So anything you create in here, in case you're wondering, will get overwritten if it's part of what's getting synced. So uh, just be wary of that. That's one of the reasons we say always do everything in here. So let me show you how this works now. So we'll SSH root at 16.69.25, and we're in. We're into that machine that's behind there. The 192.64.107. So your firewall rules work pretty much the same. You just got to make sure when you're creating them that you create them with the virtual IP as a destination. Like I said, we could create the IP address here. We'll just do it real quick to be the WAN address, but if you did so, and we'll just do this real quick, apply. Fails to go in there, but if we put in 112, but in a failover case, this would do just no good because, well, now we're doing it. So those IPs are still usable that you've assigned on the WAN side uh, for these two systems, but they're technically not gonna be part of a failover if you create any rules on them. All right, now failovers are cool, but of course what you're probably really looking for is a demonstration of how this works. How seamless is it? So we'll log back into our Debian system and uh, we'll ping something like Cloudflare's 1111. So there we are pinging away. It's working, no problems. We'll diagnostics PF top and we can then go uh, host. Forty dot one oh seven, and there we see it pinging out to Cloudflare, and it's you know everything's working. So let's go ahead and drop this firewall. Let's just uh, forcibly shut this one down. So we'll leave this ping in right here, so we have plenty of packets. 
HA master, and we could do a graceful shutdown, but what fun is that? So let's go ahead and force shut down the system. And it's down. So we'll go over here, status. We're doing all this in real time, so cart failover. It's instantly uh, the master. So let's go back over here, council. It's still pinging, and 99 packets sent, 96 received. Looks like there was a slight glitch and we lost three packets, but the machine itself is, you know, up and running, it's fast. Losing three packets, it happens sometimes on a good day. Uh, so it's pretty seamless on the failover, and the system didn't like do a long pause and a long you know wait for states to rebuild. So it's paying something else. I think we can ping Google. Or yeah, Google pinged uh, forums. I think I have ping disabled on that. Um, I do. Anyways, you get the idea though. It's not pausing. It's not like it lost all of its state tables and the machine's really slow. The failover was pretty seamless. Now, even though this is master, this is still not the head end. So under high availability sync, this is still not checked. It doesn't switch over. It's temporarily the master until the master comes back. So we're never going to boot that machine back up. And we'll start this back up. And as soon as this machine starts back up, it will become the master again, and the system will be back up and running. So while the system's down, while the master's down, unless you plan to turn the backup one into being the master, don't make any changes to it uh, because those changes will be overwritten once the system boots back up. And the process itself is pretty seamless uh, for the switchover. As soon as this is up and running and ready to route packets, it will switch right back over to this one handling everything. And those CARP addresses, those virtual IP addresses, will then be handled again by the master until the backup is needed again. And that's it. It's as simple as that. So important things to think about when you're doing this is going to be that Always make changes from the master. Make sure you have all your hardware in sync. Uh, make sure you have notifications sent because it's so seamless. Uh, people won't know it maybe went down, so make sure you have some way to monitor these servers. And you can monitor them individually because they do each have their own IP addresses. Uh, so that way you can know if something is down uh, and set. You can also have notices sent to you via email, via PFSense for any changes or uh, things that are happening. So now this one's back up and running. Status. It's in backup mode over here. Refresh the page here. And of course, this one is right back in master. Away you go. So pretty straightforward to do. Works really, really well, even though I'm using a virtual environment, which may not be as ideal. Uh, but I did virtualize these using, this is XCPNG, and I virtualize it in the methods that I've done before on the channel. Um, but that's all you have to do to make the failover work and set it up, configure it. It's not too hard to do. Please read through all the documentation because uh, people who need HA systems are, uh, once you go outside of lab play right here, usually need lots of networks, lots of LANs, and a lot of settings. So make sure you read through and understand this. Uh, this is, you know, fairly straightforward to get started, but gets complicated really quickly and does require some thought and planning, especially because for every network you create that you want as part of the failover, uh, whether that's a VLAN or a regular LAN, you've got to remember the three IP addresses, one for each of the, the master server, the backup server, and then the one that you hand out to all the clients that CARP VIP uh, that is going to be the one in between. So that has to be repeated for everything you want to be part of the failover. I, I know I'm uh, a little bit repetitive saying that, but it is an important aspect uh, when you come to planning and when you're thinking about, okay, I have to have all this set up, sit down and sketch out the whole process uh, to make sure you have it all right and put it together. All right, thanks. And I'll leave links to all this and do watch the uh, high availability uh, NetGate Hangout that they have. I'll drag it over here. I'll leave a link to this. Um, this was in March 2017 Hangout. It, they cover it in a little bit, about an hour, 26 minute depth of uh, getting it going. So I went through the basics. They go through the more in depth. And like I said, RTFM all day. It's uh, important to make sure you understand all the concepts. Thanks. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. 
If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.